Welcome to Hardware Addicts, a proud member of the Destination Linux Network. Hardware Addicts is the podcast that focuses on the physical components that power our technology world. In this episode, we're going to discuss the 10th gen Intel offerings as promised from episode 9, everything we know about Intel Optane, and how Intel's 10th gen is going to fare in the current market. In the camera corner with Wendy, we're going to discuss how sensors capture color. All of this and more coming up. So sit back, relax, and plug in, because Hardware Addict starts now. I'm Ryan, your tech guide through the universe, and with me today are my two co-hosts, Wendy, our resident photographer extraordinaire and hardware enthusiast, along with Michael, the software sage and hardware padawan. So let's find out what tech adventures everyone has had this week. Michael, tell us you bought something amazing. So instead of doing my own personal hardware uh, thing this week, I decided I think it'd be cooler if we were to talk get something from the audience and we got an email that I wanted to talk about. This is not me trying to sidestep the topic completely. I'm just, because I just wanted to. you didn't get any hardware. You didn't get no, any I just, hardware. No, I just, I wanted to none. offer. Yeah. Zero. Nope. I'm offering yeah. my time to the community. <laughs> Therefore, they say I'm doing, I'm doing a good host thing. Dear Hardware Addicts crew, in recent episode <laughs> was stated that Amazon Fire tablets aren't really strong competitors in the Android tablet market because they are cheap plastic tablets and Fire OS is just spyware. He says, I totally agree with this, and everyone I've known that's tried this bloated Kindle hates it. But the important thing to note here is that it's horrendous software is a lot of the problem. I found that it's actually a really great tablet when I removed Fire OS and put Lineage OS on it. It's still low-end hardware, so users shouldn't expect to play the latest and greatest games or whatever on it. But the $50 price tag or less, depending on where you get it, for someone who wants to to read e-books, write emails, or web browse, this is an amazing tablet. Once you remove Fire OS, uh, if you're interested, I have a, attached a short video below so you can see it. And we'll have a link in the description for that if you'd like to check it out. And thanks. Uh, best wishes, Benjamin. You know, this is a really good point. I did kind of give Kindle a little bit of hate and for all the reasons that Benjamin mentioned here above. But if you can get that hardware for cheap and then put a different operating system on it like Lineage, then it really becomes a much better tablet, right? It doesn't have all the bloatware and Mm -hmm. ads and everything that Kindles will have. I don't know about their main tablet line, but I know with their e-readers, you can buy a version with ads or without ads. And if you get one with ads... Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, if you get one with ads... The Fire tablets are the same way that way. You can get them with or without ads. Oh, so they're both that way. I know you can pay after you buy one to remove the ads, Which is nice. I actually appreciate that Amazon offers that. I just don't want ads on any of my devices anyway. Ads are only shown on like the the main ones because we have fire tablets that my kids use, but it's only on the adult section on the kids side of it. They're never shown any ads and they don't actually ever leave the kids section. But I run lineage on my phone and, and absolutely loved it. So I'm considering on all of the kids' tablets wiping Fire OS off of it and putting Lineage on it. I love this idea. I'm so happy that Benjamin wrote this in because it's something we should know, being that we play with Linux and other operating systems, and you can you know, hack away with your phone and Android and put Lineage on it. So it's something I guess I should have thought of, but really wasn't considering because of just my distaste. But really, their tablets are a good price. And if you can just get rid of the software, you've really got yourself a pretty good value. But how many tablets does your family have, Wendy? Because you had like iPads too, don't you? <laughs> we have we have one iPad and then we have four Fire tablets and a really old Samsung tablet that's like years old. It doesn't even turn on anymore. Uh, but the Fire tablets have been nice. Like I said, it's just been in the kids section so they can read their books and listen to their audiobooks and then play a few games on there. And I haven't had to worry about what else are they getting into. But if I can change the ROM on it to Lineage, I'm still controlling what is on that tablet. And it'll have 
a much better overall operating system in which they will get more out of the tablet that they're using. It'll probably be faster as well on top of that. Oh, absolutely. Because even on the kids' side of it, it is slow. Oh my goodness, it's slow. It's painful when I need to go change settings on it. So thank you, Benjamin, for sending in that email. Wendy, what have you been up to? Well, I have absolutely loved my kitchen system so much that I am hooking my in-laws up with an HP 8300. So it's that small form factor computer. It's going to be running the same um, third gen i5 that's in mine. And it'll give them absolutely everything they need. They've been using a laptop now for what, the past eight years. And I was thinking I'd go ahead and replace the spinning drive in it with an SSD. Then I decided, no, I'm not going to go through all the work of doing that. I'd rather set them up with a computer that's easier for me to maintain. Because like me, they live in a really dusty environment. And that's part of the issues that this computer is having is it really needs cleaned out bad again. When I'm there, I don't want to spend my entire time doing maintenance on the computer. So it'd be really nice if I could just pop off the top dust it out, put it back together, run an update, and be good to go. So they're getting the HP 3800 that's going to be mounted under the cabinets in their kitchen. Then we're putting a 24-inch monitor on a swivel arm for them so my mother-in-law can use it either at the bar or turn it around when she's in the kitchen and use it for recipes and stuff. So I'm super excited about getting the system set up for them. The last thing I'm waiting on is the SD card reader that's going with it. After that, I will have all the pieces of their new system here, and I'll be able to go set it up for them. That is really awesome, but I kind of feel like you're rubbing it in my face that you're like, hey, not only are my in-laws going to have a kitchen computer set up, but I have one as well. In fact, you'll probably give one to everyone in your family. Meanwhile, mine still isn't ready. Is that what you're doing here? Wait, wait a minute. I thought you were the one all up about mine's going to be better than yours. Neener, neener, neener. It will when it's built tell one you day. What I'm doing. Neener, neener, neener. <laughs> 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 well, wow. Just wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, but it's, it. it's super cool. I'm, I, I love this computer. Like I said, it, it's an older CPU, but it is absolutely solid for anything that they need to do. And it's great for that system. I absolutely, I do a lot of my show notes actually on the computer system because I don't have a standing desk yet. And it's really nice to be able to stand at the counter, work on show notes, do some research and that kind of stuff at a place where I can set up. The 8300 has a i5 in it. It has eight gigabytes of RAM. Well, I guess you could change that. Well, the one I'm looking at is a renewed one on Amazon. It's only 142 bucks for the whole machine, right. which is a pretty good deal. Is that what you're looking at? The and on gigabyte? eBay, yeah, they're they're getting all they need is eight gigs of RAM. So yeah, they'll be getting eight gigs of RAM, and they like I said, they really don't need a whole lot of power. That third gen i5 has more than anything that they need as long as you're browsing the web, just looking at some basic YouTube videos, that kind of things. So this is an extremely well equipped machine for that. It's small form factor, so it can fit almost anywhere. And the price is so stinking good. You can find them on eBay, too, for really good prices, anywhere between like 125 to 150 bucks. Really, they're a steal of a deal for a system that you can put almost anywhere. Very nice. So I've had some kind of a downer this last couple of weeks, too. I built my computer, and I was so excited about all the components that have went into this system. And I had my heart set on a Radeon 7. When I upgraded, that's what I wanted. But because everybody has been having to do the work from home thing lately, and AMD did a short run on those cards, not only is it now so hard to find a new one, the new prices and the used prices have gone absolutely outrageous. So I'm super bummed because it looks like I won't be getting the Radeon 7. I'm going to have to go a different route on the GPU. That really is unfortunate. I think 
like I've said many times, Radeon 7 is one of the best cards I've ever put in a machine. I absolutely love it. It got much better with age as typical with AMD where they fix the software down the road in their GPU world. But it's it's such a fantastic card, and it's unfortunate they did a short run of it. But there was some news that released actually today about the Radeon Pro Ooh. 7, which has been released. But before I get you all excited about it, unfortunately, this is meant for more professional applications and runs $1,899 and won't be available till mid-June. But if you're, you're willing, cry. if you're willing to wait... Till June and spend the eighteen hundred dollars, you'll have a pro level card with which for photo editing and the things you do, you still get the high bandwidth memory, which is ultra expensive memory, and a huge boost in performance compared to its prior one. So if you get that, you officially will hold the crown of having the fastest computer out there. It just costs you eighteen hundred dollars. Ryan, you know my husband listens to this podcast and you just told him how much it costs. There's no way I'm getting this card. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I meant $180. My bad. It. $180 is what I meant to say. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, was, we didn't, we didn't make an extra zero in there. <laughs> I have a Neo Geo mini arcade in my hands and I did a video on my YouTube channel about this little device and I'm in love with it. It's I, I generally have stayed away from these mini devices. Like I got this Super Nintendo mini when it came out and I just didn't enjoy it. It just didn't feel the same. It didn't give me that nostalgia. Yeah. But What's I actually, the point of getting a mini of something that ridiculously underpowered? Like who cares about that? But the Neo Geo was like one of those things. You're like, I want a Neo Geo. That's all. You kind of an arcade in your house. And they're like, oh, it's $500 per game. Okay. Exactly. No, that's exactly where I was going. When I was a kid, I remember staring at this thing in the game shop windows, drooling like, I wonder if one day I could own one of those. And of course, you know, my mom would smack me on the back of the head like, keep dreaming. Yeah, there's not enough <laughs> chores in the world to get a $500 machine, especially back then. You can't keep your room clean enough. Exactly. And so when the Neo Geo Mini came out, I purchased it because it went on sale for about $39. We talk about hunting for sales what? and things. So you couldn't, I could not pass that up at that price because it retailed for, I think, 75. You can generally see them on sale for around 50, 60. This one was 39 bucks and I, I just couldn't pass up nice. the chance to try it. Now, a lot of these games are available. You could go on Steam and other places and play some of these video games. But again, there's just something about it coming from the original form factor with the arcade sticks. Now, it didn't have the micro switches that came in the original Neo Geo controller, but I didn't have the original Neo Geo controller, so I only know that because other people were mad that it didn't have the micro switches, but to me, <laughs> it feels great. The, the button play is great, and even though it's a 3.5-inch screen, which is pretty small, you can see the That's characters tiny. perfect. It's a very clear screen, and you can have a ton of fun of it, but I fell in love with many of these games that are included with this. Obviously, it has a lot of fighting games and things, but there's this monster game, King of Monsters, that is just so awesome. If you're a fan of Godzilla or other monster movies, you get to play a giant monster fighting another monster in the middle of a city. You throw them, smash buildings, police come shoot at you, but it doesn't do any damage because you're a giant monster, and it's so much fun. <laughs> You can also hook this up through yeah. HDMI, so you can play this through your t television. You can hook up. It has two USB-C yes. ports where you can hook up extra controllers to it. They really kind of stuck everything in this little mini game console that is something fun you can take with. Now, it doesn't have battery pack, so it's not really portable, but if you just have a USB-C charging pack, you could run it right off of that because it requires near nothing. But I've had a ton of fun with this little device. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds awesome. awesome. I, it sounds like it would be right up my son's alley. Yeah, I can't wait to borrow it from you. Uh, this, but I like that the <laughs> the Neo Geo is always one of those game consoles. Like as a kid growing up, you're like, oh, this is something that you know you can't have because it was so expensive. But it was always one of those things that I've wanted myself as well. And it was especially because if you were like a big gamer, you know, as a kid, you would see all these other things. Like I had every system. Even the the Sega the Sega Ma Mega System or the Master System, uh, they had the different like in Sega CD and all this other stuff that were like 
you know, just random things. But the only one I couldn't get, I even had to Dreamcast and all that. I couldn't get the Neo Geo because it was just too ridiculous. Even the used versions years later were still ridiculously expensive because they became collector's items. So now that they actually made it where you could sort of have an experience with a Neo Geo, that is just awesome. And I can't wait to uh, borrow it. Now, was there there was another console I remember I couldn't afford, and that was the Jaguar from Atari. Yeah, the yeah the Jaguar. Did yeah. you do you remember this one? The Jaguar was the was like kind of it was kind of competing to the Neo Geo and also the Sega CD sort of. So it was like in that realm, and it was it was more expensive. It wasn't expensive as the Neo Geo, but it was the second most expensive for sure. Yeah, because I remember that being another one that came out, and I had a few older friends that ended up purchasing that one, and I guess because it was probably in the $300, $250, $300 range, which again, we're talking yeah. years and year, you know decades ago. So it, it was a much different time then, and, and your parents weren't yeah, going to spend money the- on video games, because if you sat too close to the TV, you were going to go blind, <laughs> and video games fried your brain. So <laughs> they weren't going to spend that kind of money. Yeah, they they didn't think about, it. you know, in, in 15 years, there's going to be esports. So you can make millions of dollars from this. No, no, no. They're just going to fry your brain. It's just going to fry your brain. It's going to fry that your brain. That no, still don't worry about is it. just crazy <laughs> to me. I'm really happy Neo Geo and other people out there recreated this little device so that people like me could finally play it. See, Mom, I became somebody. I got that Neo Geo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cleaned my own room and I got a Neo Geo. <laughs> That's right. This episode of Hardware Addicts and the entire Destination Linux network is now sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. You can get all of this plus our world-class customer service support for as low as $5 per month or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cents per hour. As Ryan would say, that's, that's darn, darn near free. free. DigitalOcean has over 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. Get started on DigitalOcean for two months free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN. And we thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode. All right, so let's get into our core story. The 10th Gen Comet Lake is here for our 10th episode of Hardware Addicts. The they knew- only possibility. <laughs> yes. The 10th gen processor lineup finally has come out. We are that special. We are. And they, they've they been following the show, we know, for uh, all nine episodes <laughs> leading up to this one. So they're like, you know what? Let's, let's give them something <laughs> to stop their little AMD fandom over and drop some of the 10th gen processors. And they come with 10 cores. Now, that may be why 10th gen, 10 core. But I think it's more hardware addicts related, probably. Mm, probably intel confirmed (laughs) intel is the undisputed (laughs) king of cpus well they held that title right up until the ryzen lines have come out but they still kind of hold on to it but i think more people were leaning towards amd cpus these days and certainly amd has caused if nothing else intel to do some price drops and be more consumer friendly but we all knew eventually the sleeping giant was going to awake and drop a bomb on AMD's party, and that day, unfortunately, isn't today. But, and this is a big but. Oh, I like those, and I cannot lie. This could be the prep for something <laughs> really big going on in the future with Intel. Who's excited about 17 new processors? I don't know that I'm necessarily excited about 17 new pro- processors, but I'm definitely excited that Intel is really starting to push the force going after AMD. Let's have some competition between the two. Let's see some CPU wars because I want both companies to be putting out their best product. So let's see what they've got to offer. All right. Well, let's talk about in general what the 10th gen is going to offer. And we'll go into some of the specifics, but 
with 17 new processors, it's going to be hard to cover everything. So we're going to have to yeah, just, a lot. yeah, kind of go through some of the basics here. But you get, are you ready, 14 nanometer architecture. No way. Is that the first time they've ever done that? No. They've done oh, okay, it for cool. a really, wah, really wah, long time. <laughs> so that's not very oh. exciting. What would have been great is if the 10th gen Intel CPUs were not only all 10 core, but also on 10 nanometer. But that they been awesome. still haven't figured that out yet. They're still trying to get that processing to work. They had to result to some other enhancements, which are pretty cool in themselves now. They have a thinner die stem. So that's your solar thermal interface material on your CPU. And Intel says that these new processors are going to have better thermal pro- uh, performance compared to the previous generation CPUs because of that. But you're not going to want to delit a CPU in this case because it's all going to be using solder inside and you're not going to have just thermal paste. So if you're into delitting your CPU, which you shouldn't be doing anyways, <laughs> you definitely don't want to do it here because you're just going to rip it apart. Now, I have seen videos where people were still delitting the solder base CPUs off the die, and uh, I don't know what to say about it. Just if you're not somebody who has money to waste, don't, and you're not going to get much performance improvement from doing it anyways. But And if you do have money to waste, you should go to the De- Destination Linux Network store. Exactly. <laughs> Those those products have life changing experience, whereas delitting your CPU is going to be life changing experience for your wallet only. Yeah, and also your your emotional state. <laughs> Indeed. Now they do have some other things like per core hyper threading disable enable ability with hyper threading throughout its entire family now, even including the i threes, which is a pretty impressive advancement for the i three line. That's good. You yeah. get their next version of Turbo Max Technology 3.0, which this sounds... Turbo Max. Yeah, they did a really good job naming <laughs> that, I think, for their, for their... I'll give it to them. Yeah. Now, this identifies the best performing cores to give them an extra performance boost, but that's only for the i7 and i9s, but it's still a pretty cool option, and that allows it to hit some insane speeds, which we'll talk about. Higher clock speeds all around, of course. The TDP is 125 watts for performance-based K-lines and about 65 watts in the range in between there for others. Now, if you recall Ryzen's 7 nanometer lineup, they're between 45 watts and their highest end is 105. So obviously, they are really putting the wattage to hit some of these clock speeds that they have. And that clock speed is advertised as 5 gigahertz boost. But some people have even gotten it to 5.4 gigahertz boost. And how long is that boost running? Well, that really depends on how well you can keep the thing cool, right? And because it's pumping so much wattage through that CPU, because at 5.4 gigahertz, the power consumption was somewhere around 250 watts. So you really better have an amazing cooling solution to hit that. Now, Boost can be maintained if you have the right cooling ability for it. And, of course, if you have processes and the right amount of RAM and everything else that's just constantly able to handle all the processes being thrown around your machine. But I don't think Boost is really meant to stay there for long, long periods of time. But the fact that it can hit it and knock out some processes and go back is still pretty impressive to hit 5.4 gigahertz when it's needed. Well, it's not that impressive if it heats up so fast, like cooling solution wise that it doesn't actually finish the process. It's got to drop back down. So that's I'd true. like to see some testing on this and see, you know, what it comes to, how hot does it get with your average CPU cooler and, and what do you need to keep it cool in order to run maybe a full render on a video? Well, since Intel actually decided to release the 10th gen because of the 10th episode of Hardware Addicts, they should totally totally just go ahead and send us one of these things to test to the benchmark. I think that's a good idea. Absolutely. They should. They should send three, in fact, for us to bet. Actually, four, because I need one to put in my kitchen cabinet so I have a better computer than Wendy in my kitchen. (laughs) So, you know, they have some impressive speeds here. Their prior gen limited edition i9-9900KS was 95 watt TDP. So what they're doing is they're increasing the power output here. The the 
wattage required in order to kind of boost these cores, but the ability to also take your best performing cores and boost those only is pretty awesome uh, ability as well. And when you look at some of the speeds that all the benchmarks aren't out and everybody hasn't got their hands on this yet, obviously, but some of the speeds that are rumored out there, some of the sneaky benchmarks that show up in some of the tools really show an impressive performance. And Intel is saying, hey, this is our fastest. This is not just theirs, but the fastest gaming processor out there, period. And at some of the speeds that they're able to hit here, that may be the case. And if you're in a very cold region, the great thing is it'll probably double as a space heater like the old AMDs did. (laughs) But you're definitely going to be able to have bragging rights here. I would say this is probably going to give AMDs top of the line a run for its money. Now, again, when you take in all the factors, you still might want to stick with AMD. But it's pretty it's pretty good what they've done with 14 nanometer. It's impressive that they've held on to this this long and are still just churning out new processors that are able to hit some impressive speeds with this older technology, manufacturing technology. Wendy, one of the things that caught your attention right away when we were talking in the pre-show was you're not just going to be able to get this processor and put it in your machine. Right. You are going to need a new motherboard if you are going to run the 10th gen Intel chips. That is just Because they are going to... Yeah, they're going to a whole new socket. So there's actually going to be more pins on the CPU. And I'm sure part of that is to help push the power for not only is everybody getting more cores in general, but being able to hit these boost speeds. So that comes with the fact of, you know, they're still on 14 nanometer. How are we going to be able to get enough juice, get enough power through this? And for them, that means we're going to have to go to a different socket type. So you're not only spending money on a new CPU, you're having to account for how much are you spending on an Intel board. That's a huge reason why people don't switch to between Intel and AMD very often because the cost of getting a lot of times new RAM, a new motherboard, and the new CPU is very prohibitive. Yeah, it's a huge upgrade. But when you can just slap a CPU in it, it's obviously much, much easier to convince your spouse that you need that additional upgrade. Now, with these new motherboards, though, there's certainly got to be new technology. So we're getting PCIe 4.0, right, Wendy? Mm, no, we're not. What? Wait, what? Mm, nope. We're still not getting PCIe 4.0 yet on the Intel chips. We're having to wait. It might come when we get 10 nanometer. This was a major, for me, just disappointment because the idea, if you were planning ahead here, would be, hey, we're going to move everybody to a new motherboard, but we're going to future-proof that motherboard so that if you go ahead and upgrade to this line, which, let's face it, it's it's an iterative upgrade from their prior generation, it's a slight increase in speeds, you're obviously going to be using a lot more power, but when we get our 10 nanometer out, you're going to be able to just pop the top, throw that in there, and run it. And maybe you could, I don't know if this new socket will be what they use, but without PCIe 4.0, we know that once Intel and AMD both have that on the market, that your offerings for hardware that's 4.0 compatible is going to completely multiply. You're going to have a lot more options when it comes to NVMe drives and everything else. And so it's just a shame they're not future-proofing this board. And I really wonder why they're not. you know, they've they've made the jump to making sure that they're, these new CPUs have more processing power in general. So what's holding them back from the PCI 4.0? Well, they're probably uh, work too, too busy trying to work on those uh, security mitigations in order to get the 4.0 to do it. Oh, um, that's ugly, ouch. Michael. You're being ouch. ugly. I'm not being, I'm not being ugly at all. I'm just pointing out this is probably <laughs> something they're having to spend time on. Which is probably true. Well, I'm I'm sure they are. But I mean, both AMD and C- Intel have had That's issues true. with mitigations over the last four years. They both have, but yes, Intel absolutely. has definitely seen a higher percentage of those way more. <laughs> and it seems <laughs> it seems like their CPUs have taken the biggest hit 
So this is a processor that they've had in the works for a while. So it'll still have the same vulnerabilities. We're still on 14 nanometer and there's no PCIe 4.0. Overall, it's looking like, yay, they're making some progress. Yay, we're trying to compete with AMD, which I want. I want competition between our two big CPU makers. But this just doesn't look like it's the time if you are a lover of Intel to upgrade yet. I'm just not seeing where it works out in the cost to improvement ratio. It's kind of interesting how they didn't put some of these pieces in here, yet they did make 17 different processors. I mean, when in doubt, you flood the market. I mean, Lisa Sue, when she would come out, what, every couple of months and release a new processor, it was like you knew Intel was just in their office spitting coffee all over their screen. And for a while, they're kind of like, yeah, it's impressive and it's a good price, but we're still way faster. And then as the next generation's Horizon came out, that lead Intel had just started dwindling faster and faster until they really weren't in the lead anymore. And now they are flooding the market with 17 new processors to try to get people's attention and be like, hey, we're still here. But I just don't feel like they're planning ahead properly. If you had done this and waited until you had the PCIe 4.0 ready, even though there are people out there that are like, there's just not enough PCI 4.0, it's too early. Intel was a big naysayer of it originally. Obviously, it's the next gen. It's going to take off. It's going to be there. And if you're going to spend money to upgrade both your CPU and motherboard, you're going to want to future-proof it. I think this was just a yeah. huge fail on Intel. And I love Intel. They contribute to so many things that I love out there, but they just are not making the right moves. I think they need to get some of the suits out of their executive board and put some engineers in there instead, and they might be able to turn the company around a lot faster. I think that's one of the advantages that AMD has had is the the person helping to lead their company not only loves the company, but knows the technology of the CPU and what people are wanting. And it's showing in what they're putting out. And Intel, please do the same because I want you to compete. I want there to be a battle between the two. I don't want to be just a lover of one CPU, I want it to be a tough decision on my next upgrade. Absolutely. And it has already benefited the market when AMD was basically not really competing at all. It hurt the market. Intel was able to charge whatever they wanted and people would pretty much pay for it. And they held that crown for so many years. So it's kind of fair that AMD holds the crown a little bit here, but Intel's not even... Playing. And I guess if you would take this podcast and assume it was, you know, back 10 years ago, we'd be probably saying the same thing about AMD. Like, what are you doing yeah. with your new processor line? Oh, yeah, guaranteed. And this Absolutely. is kind of the same frustration I feel here because, again, what they've done with these processors, these are no dogs. These are great processors. If you have one of the top of the line i9s here, you are going to be cruising in some games. You are going to have some fantastic speeds. But it's just not up to, from a technologist standpoint, they are not pushing the boundaries. This is really nothing new. They're just increasing the power and trying to get every little overclock they can out of the cores. Obviously, they're getting better yields in their manufacturing, but that's not anything special that's being done. We know that happens in any processing, manufacturing where your yields are going to get better and more reliable as you go. So it's it's just kind of a shame here. I really cannot wait for their 10 nanometer lineup because honestly, and I've said this before, what they've done with 14 nanometer is insane. I can't imagine what they're going to be able to do with their 10 nanometer lineup with their entire new manufacturing process. And I'm hoping it's something amazing, but I'm going to be real sad if we get to the 10 nanometer and it ends up being a dog. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I'm I'm all about the the budget conscious. I know I just did a pretty big system upgrade, but I'm planning for this system after I upgrade the GPU, which will probably be upgraded again before the CPU. But for this system to run, you know, at least five years, I don't upgrade very often. So I want the upgrade. I want the money I'm spending to be worth it 
for the increase that I'm getting and the longevity of a usable system. And right now, Intel just isn't there yet, I think, for most people and what they already have. Now, my upgrade line is probably about six months. That's when most of my stuff gets refreshed every six months. Most people, normal people, uh, upgrade their stuff generally every probably three to five years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't think most people have a constantly rolling cycle of their hardware. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they're doing it wrong. And if they're listening to this show, soon enough, they'll be rolling their hardware just like me. Sure. Fair enough. The i9s, we're going to hit these kind of quick because, you know, just reading off numbers isn't going to be that informative. But just to give you a general idea of the 17 processors is you've got your i9 line. Your top of the line is the i9 10,900K, 10,900K, whatever. Sure, sure. Why not? All four of these processors, all the way down to the i9-10900F, are 10-core, 20-thread processors, max clock speed of 5 gigahertz. They can push past that, though. They're showing with their Turbo Max there. And, of course, like we mentioned earlier, if you have the right cooling and things, you can end with their abilities, the Turbo Max 3.0, to turn on the best-performing cores and get the most out of them. You're probably going to stay away from that base clock. Most of your workloads that you're throwing at it, if you have the right cooling in there, which is pretty neat, so you're going to have a very fast machine. Your prices here are going to be $488 for your top of the line and four hundred and twenty-two down to $422. Now, of course, if you get the Intels with the K, then you can do some tweaking in there. They're unlocked. You can overclock them. You can have fun with it and see what if you can get up to 5.4, say, and try to get more performance. If you don't get the K line, then you can't. Those are locked down. You can't really overclock them. Super understandable that there's this is not a confusing naming scheme for their models. Totally get it. K means customization, obviously. K for customization. Or it's the <laughs> K at the end of unlock. That's how you can oh, think okay. of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. That that's sort of about the same as ridiculous as the one I said. Uh, but the I also don't, I, I, I wish these model things would be like a little bit more consistent because it's the K, the KF, the F, and then the no letter attached. And yet the no letter attached is not the base one. It's the F is the base one, but you have a KF that's another. Just pick, just do something consistent ever. I, I'd like that. I wish they would just go back to cool names. Monster Truck, Thread Ripper. I don't know. Knee exploder, whatever you want, <laughs> something <laughs> knee <cool>. exploder. <laughs> but yeah, knee like if it's if it's a painful, <laughs> if it's a slow processor, it's the knee exploder. <laughs> CPU explode. So it's like that, that doesn't sound like a very good marketing plan, though. It's like your your system's gonna go so fast you'll explode. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you don't want me naming it, but the the point is, if you had some cool names behind it. Now, prices have dropped here, but not by a ton. They're in line. They're obviously trying to compete with Ryzen's flagship processors. The Ryzen 9 3900X is 12 cores, 24 threads, starting at $500 at launch. But right now, you can pick them up between $430 and $450. In the middle, we have i7s ranging from the $298 to $374 with 8 cores and 16 threads. Your i7Ks can get up to 5 gigahertz boost, but have a more light base clock. You have your i5s well, as well in here, which can go up to 4.8 gigahertz boost. And then your i3s are 4.6 gigahertz at the top of their line. But of course, they have a whole series and plethora of ones in between there. But that kind of gives you an idea of what you're getting. There's a lot. There's a whole lot of CPUs I'm looking at here. and. I I hope that people who get one absolutely love them. I'm looking forward to actually seeing some real world use of them. And I'm really interested. Cooling is my biggest interest on these new CPUs, especially the i9. I want to know how hot they run. And do you have to have water cooling to effectively use this boost that they're offering? Maybe not water cooling, but probably a pretty big fan on their top of the line, especially if you're wanting to do any serious overclocking. And if you want to keep it 
away from that base clock for long periods of time. My advice here is if you're an Intel fan and more power to you for being an Intel fan, there's nothing wrong with that. Intel has made amazing products for years. I would wait this one out. I would wait until you see their 10 nanometer hit the market unless you just have money burning away that you have to spend. I don't think this upgrade is really worth from the prior generations. Unless you're like Ryan and you upgrade every six months. Yeah, but I'd still go Ryzen right now. Well, I I can't disagree there because I just did. Michael, what is your thought? I know you are an Intel fan. You ran Intel for many years. What do you think about this? (laughs) Uh, Well, of course, I'm an Intel fan. I mean, I'm I'm so into hardware and everything. Uh, I I was an Intel <laughs> person because AMD was the laughing stock for many many years, and because AMT, Intel was like the the go to uh, the go to device and you know, or the go to company. So I had like i fives and i sevens and stuff like that for multiple generations. But as soon as I went to upgrade, and it was like it was last year upgrade, there was really no option. It was AMD. And even the like, I got an older version AMD, which still could compete with a a top level i7 of the Intel, like not the highest level, but like a pretty high level. Because at one point, the i7 was the biggest, right? So you could compete in an i7 level with a year old version of an AMD, and that just shows me that the competition is kind of like they they've swapped sides, and it seems like Intel is just falling behind even more. I think that it'd be great if Intel actually comes out with something that competes on the same level, but also does it in a way that's no longer being the space heater that it is becoming also doing it in a cheaper range or like more comparable to AMD anyway, just to have something that creates this competition because, you know, as we all know that competition creates uh, better quality products, I do want them to get to that point. But at this point, particular example of the 17 different options i don't think any of the 17 give me any reason to care i think that's well said and you know for me it's also about pushing the technology forward if they were even slower than amd and i think and you're going to see in the benchmarks that in many respects in certain areas they're going to beat the ryzen top of the line out there in gaming certain games and things like that But it's about pushing the technology forward so that we see the next generations and the next generations building up with things like being on a new fabrication process, 7 nanometer versus 14 nanometer, at least 10 nanometer, being able to bring in future proofing the technology that's surrounding that CPU like PCIe 4.0 and those type of things are far more important to me than I see a company pushing the technology through that barrier, through that wall than it is just saying, wow, we hit five gigahertz. I mean, so what? How many things can really take advantage of that? It's cool. Don't get me wrong. I still love it. And I'll still be happy when I see, you know, AMD hit those speeds and all of that. But it's not everything. And it doesn't push the technology forward and through the barriers that we've hit for so long where everything was just, you know, next generation. Here's from two gigahertz to 2.5. Wahoo. I mean, it's cool. That's been my biggest complaint with phones for years. It seems like, you know, there for a while we were having big jumps every time this new device is coming out. And anymore, all you see is, yep, it's a teeny bit better and we're going to charge a thousand bucks for it. So I'm kind of feeling that way right now with Intel. Yeah, we're a little bit better and we're going to not charge you as much, but. It's well, when you count the motherboard, it might be a little bit close to, <laughs> close to it. Anyway. Yeah. I just wanted to point out one thing that you said, Ryan, about the the boost speed, the five gigahertz part. Like I remember back in the in the day when you know we got to the first gigahertz thing, and it was a huge, like monstrous achievement. And then also the two gigahertz was another just monstrous thing. And then it started becoming no one cares. Like it becomes yeah. to the point where. If the, the only thing you're talking about is having a higher boost clock, you're like, eh, okay, but like it's only 0.7 more than the other one. Like, it, do something interesting. And that's just, that's what I feel about Intel is that they're not doing anything interesting. They're just kind of going along the same path that they have for a long time. 
I, I will say the Turbo Max thing is cool, but if that's the only but that's the only thing that they offer that has any interest to me. And that's it's not gonna be changing that much in comparison to what they need to change. Let me see if I can change your mind on something a little bit. Because in our brain filler this week, we're gonna talk about Intel Optane. And Optane, I think, is kind of beastly. Well, it could be. Wow, I feel like I say that a lot with Intel stuff. It it could be really cool. It could be. <laughs> but there's it's always a good name, a, at least. I'll give them that. Yeah, Intel Optane. So while AMD is floating PCIe 4, Intel is still holding out on us. They do have something that's quite powerful, a lot of capability here called Intel Optane. Its initial implementation wasn't super popular in the consumer world because it was very expensive, not very convenient because you had to have kind of a separate Optane card and then you would have your drives. And it some in some cases now they're start, you're starting to see it in laptops and things, but in a much cooler implementation because they've taken that Optane technology and they've combined it with the SSD storage so that you're only taking up one NVMe port in this case, and it's deploying something called 3D Crosspoint, which most of what's behind 3D Crosspoint is completely top secret, so we don't know everything about it, but there is some cool videos and things you can watch about how the technology works and how dense they've been able to uh, make the storage. And the basics of Optane are that it can cache your data from your most used programs which allows it to accelerate load times and execution considerably. So I like to think about it as something in between your processor cache, which is your fastest. Then you have your RAM. And of course, at the very bottom, you have your SSD when you're talking about speeds. And with the Optane, it's somewhere in the middle between your RAM and your SSD. What's really cool about this is that it doesn't have the volatility that RAM has with storage, so it can actually store data longer periods of time without a constant supply of power, which makes it really unique as well. Now, have either of you heard of Optane before we talked about it here? Because, again, it's not been in the consumer market. I have. I've heard about it a little bit here and there, but for the most part... Because it hasn't been so much in the consumer market, it hasn't been high on my radar. Actually, I heard about Optane about 45 seconds ago. There you go. That's interesting because Optane's been out there. Like I said, it's been in some consumer laptops. It's definitely been out there in the commercial market. But even for me as a hardware addict, it was something I would see. But then I look at the price and go, I don't know what it is. And I don't even care because it was like $1,900 for a PCIe version of the card and it was just insane but i've gone and started learning some more because looking at intel's advertisement for their new processors they're like hey these motherboards are optane compatible and i really wanted to understand some more about it and of course if you're a listener to this podcast and you understand optane at a much more advanced level want to leave us some information we'd be happy to read it in one of our future episodes but basically the hybrid optane drives you get its latency measured in microseconds versus milliseconds. And you usually can get these in variants of 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes, again, combined with the larger SSD storage now up to 1.5 terabytes. Before it was like 50 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, but now you're in the terabytes. So they are making this more accessible, more usable for your average consumer to utilize as real true storage. All of this is combined so that your processor can spend less time waiting and more time computing, resulting in greater efficiency. Now, the microsecond thing is pretty cool. A microsecond is equal to 1,000 nanoseconds or 1 1,000th 1, of a millisecond. Pretty fast. Yeah, that is pretty fast. This is the drive that you'd want your OS loaded on with the applications you're running so that it can say, have this stuff loaded up in the ready to go you go to launch a program that you use on a regular basis it's up and working in no time flat and you're off and working and not having to worry about waiting for stuff to load and i mean now for the most part computers are pretty fast in general 
But when it comes down to work or playing and the stuff that you use all the time, being able to access it faster, being able to write data faster is always a plus. It kind of sounds like this would be perceptively instantaneous. Like you wouldn't be able to tell much of a right. difference. Like you can already boot now in like eight seconds. You know, it's not a huge problem. It's like, oh no, we have to wait minutes. Like, like in, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, it was like minutes. Now, eight seconds. So anytime people talk about, you know, oh, my system to boot as fast as possible, like it's already eight seconds. But now to the having this kind of technology where it's basically instantaneous, that is pretty awesome. And I will say that, if the new if the new stuff could have Optane at a reasonable price, I think it might be enough to justify the not so in, innovative on the CPU side. That's pretty cool, and I definitely want to try it at some point. Hopefully, it will come down in cost, you know, in a few years or something. Yeah, it's still pretty expensive. I mean, if you're running uh, in the commercial world, of course, it's nothing to them to spend four hundred or nineteen hundred dollars on something like this that can increase performance. And initially, that's where it was targeted. You could put one of these inside a machine, and if you had spinning drives, it would make it faster than if you had SSD drives because of that additional cache where it was sitting in the lanes, which is awesome. But when again, when I take this back and think about Intel's 10th gen, their new motherboards, imagine how fast Optane is. It saturates the PCIe 3.0 lane. It's sending, it's able to process so much information through those lanes, it saturates it. Imagine what you could have done doubling that lane at 4.0 with Optane. So it's just like they're just staying with the 14 nanometer and then having this extra speed. Man, the stuff you could do. Yeah, I feel like they're just missing, like they have probably issues with fiefdoms within Intel where you have this really cool project that really needs to hit the consumer market because I feel like they've done a terrible job if there is any plans to really take it to consumer outside of maybe laptops and things of getting it out there so people know about it. I mean, all of us basically agreed that we'd heard it. Or maybe you'd heard the word, but it wasn't anything any of us investigated. And I think that speaks volumes in itself. This really cool technology that you could have paired with this okay CPU thing, but you got the 4.0 on the motherboard. You've got the Optane on the motherboard. I bet you would have some really impressive speeds and things you could show for I.O., but they just really haven't taken that next level of combining it all into one product which is where I think Intel is missing because they have some other cool products I'm very excited about, like their graphics cards. You know, them coming out with some graphics yeah. cards has me super excited because I know they're going to go after the low and mid tier, which is where most consumers are buying anyways. And they're going to make pricing and things even more competitive in that market. And let's face it, their integrated GPUs are amazing. I can't believe... You I remember when you used to get an integrated Intel GPU, you're like, oh, gosh, I probably can't even run solitaire on this thing. Now you can game on those things. You can game pretty good on those integrated GPUs. They're pretty awesome. Yeah. And also, like we talked about in a previous episode where Intel announced that they were doing this thing with NVIDIA where they could have this massively powerful, uh, quick features of using the hardware to do uh, graphics rendering and stuff like that. And I think that there's so many things that Intel is doing that are very interesting, but they seem to be kind of far off or in their right, own field. Do. Yeah. And it, it just seems like they're, they're not on the same page with the rest of the company. So like all the stuff that's really good is not really available to us to use yet. And the stuff that is available is like, yeah, but we want the other stuff. Give us the other stuff. I know, I know it sounds like I might be down on Intel and it's not that I'm down on Intel. I think they are, they've produced some absolutely fantastic products, but it's, you see stuff like this, you see these possibilities, these things that this company can put out, put in the market and get into, you know, your, your average photographer's hands and being able to work their images in these programs that they're using all of the time. They're not pulling it into the market. And that's what makes me sad is it's not that I think that Intel is less than AMD. It's, oh my goodness, you can do so much more. What's holding you back? Optane had me super excited the more I learned about it. And 
it is one of the areas when I think about pushing through that wall where they're doing that, right? Cache sitting just on your CPU while the seven nanometer allowed AMD to put surrounded CPU with way more cache. You have this bottleneck that's always been between your RAM and your SSD. They're just, the SSDs are super fast and we know how much it changes your machine going from a spinning drive to an SSD. But this takes that to a whole new level in being able to speed up and and remove that bottleneck from your machine. And then you couple that with PCIe 4.0, you've just got a recipe for something amazing. I really hope Intel hears this podcast since it is the 10th episode celebrating their 10th gen Intel (laughs) CPUs. And they do what we say and kind of break down their fiefdoms inside and bring this products all together in a consumer way because I think they would dominate AMD combining some of these together in one package, even with a 14 nanometer CPU. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Wendy. So take us into the camera corner and tell us how sensors gather color. So This is such a cool topic. I have to say that I'm having so much fun myself learning more about how sensors work and sharing this information with everybody. So last week we talked about when photons hit your sensor, it creates a charge. Your sensor holds on to that charge, passes it on to the processor and how much charge was in certain areas, how many photons hit a specific area of your sensor determines how light or dark it was. But this left out color. We now have a black and white image. But as we know, you take a picture with your even smartphone, you've got a color image. So think back to your high school biology class. For some of you, you may be in this class currently. So you've got a fresh take on the whole idea. But our eye works really similar to how a camera sensor will gather color. So we've got the lens in the front of our eye, which focuses light on the back of our eye, just like the lens on your camera focuses the light onto your sensor. And then we have rods, which detect how much light and cones that detect color. It sends all that information to the brain for processing because it doesn't do you any good if the sensor is collecting that information but there's no way to process it. Speaking of color, it's one of those things we take, I think, for granted. And I especially realize this when there's these new glasses that have come out that allow people who are colorblind to see color for the first time. Have you seen any of these videos? I haven't, but that sounds absolutely amazing. Well, what's shocking about this technology and watching people react is that you have these grown men Some of them, you know, in their later years, you have young kids and everybody's reaction is the same across these videos. As soon as they put these glasses on and they can see color, tears stream down their face because Mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. It's so gorgeous to see the depths of reds and blacks and yellows and greens that it overwhelms them emotionally. And that really hit hard with me because it's something I've taken for granted to be able to look around a room or look at balloons, which is a big thing. They like when they put these glasses on for the first time, people will have balloons with all the variety of colors and really enjoy that color. And when I think as a photographer for you, Wendy, like colors are so important. I mean, black and white can be powerful too, but colors are so important to the work that you do. It can affect your mood. It can make you hungry. It can make you sad. It has all of these amazing elements that we don't think about. It's actually interesting that you bring up that topic because when you, when it's something that those, those kinds of things are, so we take it for granted. Yeah. But that I remember one of those videos I saw and it was, it was such an emotional impact just watching it that I still remember one of the reactions where this guy was talking about how it was, he was, he was crying about how like emotional it was that he was able to see these. And at the end of him, you know, getting his, his, uh, you know, his bearings together and everything. He looked, he goes, Oh, so that's what purple is. I, th- <laughs> I thought that was just such an awesome thing to, you know, experience with someone. I just, it, it's an interesting concept that I never even consider prior to seeing those videos. That is cool. I will totally have to check that out. Yeah. Cause color is, is so important. Color and 
and light are central to photography. Well, even in what Michael does working with graphics and websites and marketing, color is extremely important in your planning for those projects, mm -hmm. what's your goals. The same thing with images, what's your goal, what feelings do you want to come from this image? And so much of that centers on the mood of the light and the mood of the color. So now that we know how eyes work, how does it work in a camera? It's similar, but what's the difference? Right. So in a camera, we don't have rods or cones, but we have little sections called sensors or photocytes. Now, each photocyte is a unit that gathers light. So that is part of the how light or dark is it. But at the same time that it's gathering light, it has a filter over top of it. So like our eyes, we'll detect red, green, and blue. Each photocyte has a red, green, or blue filter. We call this a Bayer filter because a man with the last name of Bayer came up with this formula in creating how sensors went from being just black and white to having color. Is this the same person who made aspirin? We need to find out. We no, need to investigate. <laughs> it's not the same person that made aspirin, but it's it's kind of funny it's that we have two very important things that are both named after somebody with Bayer. Mm. I, I like how you added a dad joke and I didn't have to do it. I appreciate yeah, you're welcome, Michael. <laughs> Ryan is, is helping you out on this side. <laughs> so if you have a photo site that has a red filter on it, it can only gather red light. So if you're looking at something, you're seeing all the different colors of light, all the frequencies, they have different wavelengths. And so these red sensors will only really gather red light. There's a little bit of overlap, um, especially when it comes to your eyes as they are a little bit more sensitive. So red can gather like a little bit of green and blue can gather a little bit of green and green can gather a little bit of both blue and red. So when we're you're looking at your camera or if you were able to get like a real close zoomed in picture of it, a pixel is made out of in a grid pattern, a red next to a green on top. And then below that, you would have a green and a blue. So in each of those pixels, you have two greens. Why do you have two greens? Well, for one, because it can pick up a little bit of both the blue and a little bit of both the green. And our natural eyesight, this is one reason I brought biology into it, is our eyes are a little more sensitive to the green channel for that same reason, because those green cones can pick up some in the blue spectrum and some in the red spectrum. It helps to have a wider shade of overall colors. That actually kind of explains the colorblindness of red and blue not being able to tell the difference because your eyes are looking more for the green aspects of it. So, or maybe I'm just talking about. Well, you definitely I have. have no I believe you also have more green cones in your eyes. But yeah, if you're missing the red cones, say you are to all of the red photocytes in your camera died, you wouldn't see purples. Because you have to have red in order to get purples. Or say you don't have the blue photo sites in your camera. Then you would be missing all of the yellows. And this variety of shades in between. So while it's only three colors, these three primary colors, having each one is so very important. Because when you take and blend that data together, it gives you a mix of different colors. So say you opened up GIMP and you turn on the color changing and in, the, in GIMP or any other photo processing, you have a red, green, and blue channel. Change any of the values in that box and you will get a wide variety of different colors. All white, is maxed out 255 is the value on all red green and blue if you have black or the absence of color so remember white light is all of those colors together 
So black would be all zeros down the line and you can have so many variations in between. Now, camera sensors are not as sensitive as our eyes. And this is where prices vary in how much can that sensor pick up and how good is the processing on the back end? Because it doesn't matter if your sensor is amazing, if it can't process this data, it does you absolutely no good because you end up with a crappy picture in the end. This is all fascinating. I've seen these settings. I've played with them to get the colors, but honestly, never really thought too much about it. I feel like this is more of a brain filler than anything else we've talked about today. The, the last two episodes have definitely been of Camera Corner, have been brain fillers. And like I said, I have loved this stuff. I think it's so cool. So you have these four different stencils, typically two green, one red, one blue, making up a pixel. But that's not all because every single photo site helps out in a different pixel. So to make it easy, to make it easier to understand, because you can grid this up in crazy ways. But you take a central photo site and all eight photo sites around it are contributing data to the color of that pixel. You're taking information from all around it. So when you zoom in really close to the picture on your computer and you see all these little squares, which we typically think of as a pixel, it's not only that single photo site that is helping determine what color is coming out of it, but it's all eight photo sites around it. And I do the same thing when I'm doing word finds. I'll look for the first letter of the word and go all the way around the outside to find my word. Once well, of that, it's going all the way around the outside to help find your color. Very cool. That is, that is really interesting. I, so I like that, the idea of this, this cold, this whole, like having a brain filler on the camera stuff that also has a brain filler on biology <laughs> in addition to it. So that was, that's fun. <laughs> Wendy has and, just brought yeah. the school to you. Heck yeah. One more thing just to kind of wrap it all up. But in the, the processor, in this processing power, the term that is used to take all of this information that's gathered from all of these different photo sites, that's called demosaicing. If you were to look at just the raw data, you have a bunch of squares of different color. And as the process goes through and determines and gets these kind of different shades, your sensor will demosaic. And if you've looked at, say, Darktable, that's the program I use for the backend processing. If you start with a raw image inside the software, you can use different demosaic algorithms to get better, smoother, nicer colors in the end. So keep those raw files. You can do so much with all of that color information on the back end. It's not just the processor in your camera that can utilize that. I love it. Well, thank you, Wendy, for schooling us there. And that's it. Our 10th episode of Hardware Addicts is a wrap. Thank you so much for listening to the show that brings you your biweekly tech fix. If you're not all lit up on tech yet, then be sure to check out all the amazing content on Destination Linux Network. Head to destinationlinux.network to check out the podcast, the YouTube partners that are available there. If you want more information to fill your brains with, check out all those shows, subscribe to them. You're going to love it. Remember, there's no such thing as too much hardware. Learn, build, innovate, and grow. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll see you next week for another colorful Optane Cached episode of Hardware Apps. Every time you pull it off, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm getting good at it. You are getting very good at it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs>